We have one apology uh, from Michael Copeland. Uh, maybe two, Alex Spassky. Yeah. Spassky. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, um, uh, Megan and I were at uh, an all-party group uh, during the week. It uh, was formerly just UNSCR 1325, now Women, Peace and Security. Now, they met on Monday, um, and we were having a discussion uh, with a witness who produced uh, a copy, a draft copy, of the Gender Equality Strategy, uh, which she was unable to share with the group. Um, because she appeared to have been given it in confidence by the department. That would be right, Megan. So, um, I'm not quite sure what is going on, because I would have thought this committee would be in the first wave of those in receipt of a draft of such a strategy for comment. So the all-party group uh, asked if I would bring it to the attention of the committee and uh, ask if you're content that we write to the department to make clear that we're aware that this draft strategy is in some form of limited circulation and request that we are included uh, within that body of people. Content? Members, the list of the committee's current invitations is at page 22. Then the draft minutes of our meeting of the 10th of June begin on page 25 of the meeting pack. Are members content to agree to the draft minutes? Thank you. Page 31 is a list of outstanding correspondence. In the absence of comment, I refer you to our correspondence summary sheet. That's at page 33, uh, and that details correspondence received since the last meeting. I'll ask the clerk to highlight anything that requires a decision. Members, of course, you may raise any matter of correspondence that you wish to bring forward. Thanks, Chair. Um, the, the two items, actually, that I want to highlight relate to, um, to uh, issues, uh, responses regarding TBUC from the Department. The first is at page 83, which provides information um, on funding for good relations activity um, in the last two financial years and on the buddy scheme. And then at page 85 in the pack, um, there's further correspondence, include, which includes the final version of the good relations indicators. Um, and it's just really to check if members are content to add those papers to um, the body of evidence for the inquiry. Yeah. Chair, can I respond to that as well? Um, so the good relations outcome and indicator framework was approved on the 22nd of April. We were briefed on the 13th of May in relation to TBOC and the OFMDFM officials were not aware, it would appear, of that approval. Um, and it isn't not until the 17th of June that we're being provided with the new good relations outcome and indicator framework, which is well over a, a month later. Um, just fairly irregular processes again, but we do have the indicators now and in, uh, yeah, would support inclusion. Um, I, I would have thought that, that that would have been a significant enough issue for officials to actually want to take us through their final version of the indicators and how they see those being utilised to monitor performance of TBOC. Hmm. I know we have a brief, uh, we have a tight schedule and, and busy forward work programme, but it seemed to be that monitoring um, actual outcomes is one of the most important things that we can do in terms of any strategy. I suppose I propose that we do invite officials to brief us in relation to the final version of the indicators and how they will be utilised to monitor the progress of TBOC. Members content? In that, in that case, what we, we could perhaps look to is um, the 1st of July, because if we're not having our session uh, as just discussed, mm. um, we, we have potentially a bit of space, but I'm sure between now and then that will will be well uh, filled in. On, on the body scheme, briefly, um, the correspondence advises that the Department of Education have developed a business case uh, and monitoring arrangements, but that there is no funding for the scheme. Part, you may be aware <coughs> the Department of Education has also 100% uh, cut the CRED, Community Relations Equality and Diversity Programme as well. 
Um, and yet, if memory serves me correct, there is a, a shared education programme in the region of £50 million, pounds, I believe, Atlantic Philanthropies and OFMDFM jointly. So it, it seems strange that we're being advised that there is no funding for a shared education nursery primary school buddy scheme. I wonder if we could be right back to ask why any of the £50 million pounds for shared education programmes has not been deemed eligible for use by the buddy scheme. So proposal? Yeah, proposal. We went right back to the department to ask why that uh, shared education programme fund had not been considered for use to progress the, the body scheme. Okay. Anybody in disagreement? Okay. Okay, thank you, Chris. Members, draft uh, forward work programme pages 150-151. Uh, we do need to, to just make a couple of points here because we come towards recess. Next week, I think we need to take a, a quick look uh, back over our strategic priorities for the year. We're going to have to have another session on NIPSO, uh, looking at then initial drafts of uh, the bill report, inquiry report. Now, in terms of the um, Children's Bill, uh, we discussed an additional meeting to undertake clause-by-clause clause scrutiny, but um, it's proving difficult. Plenary next week is, is just looking increasingly uh, heavy, uh, and that could give us huge difficulties in arranging a meeting. So I'm wondering what people would think about. We we're going to go through the bill now, but doing the actual formal clause-by-clause clause next Wednesday. Is that... Are we agreeable to that? OK. So as we're going to be doing some, some heavy stuff next week, I'm going to propose that we take out the session on EU issues and move that back a week, because we will, that, that will leave us still with three you know, relatively heavy sessions within next week's meeting. Content? OK. So we move to consideration of the Children's Services Cooperation Bill. Uh, the clerk's brief is page 153, correspondence from OF MDFM 154. And the amendments proposed by the department are such that a revised draft bill, which details all changes, is at page 157. Uh, we uh, previously received a briefing on amendments uh, being considered by the department. Um, and following the subsequent deliberations on evidence received by the department, uh, we indicated we were, were broadly supportive in principle with the direction of FMDFM were going in, but that was, of course, subject to site uh, of the proposed amendments. Similarly, uh, the sponsor, Mr Agnew, uh, equally was content with the direction of travel but wanted to see them. He's had a chance to consider the paper that's in front of us today. His views, initial views at least, are in your table pack at page 17. Uh, members, it would be useful if we could take a firm view today on what's being proposed by the department. Uh, so I would suggest that we should discuss the clauses uh, in the department's draft bill one at a time, stressing this is not formal clause-by-clause -clause scrutiny. Uh, and after we've heard from the department, um, it would be useful if we can decide whether we believe as a committee any other amendments might still be required. So. Peter Hutchinson joins us, June Wilkinson joins us, and Margaret Rose McNaughton joins us. So we've got a draft bill which is significantly different to the one introduced by uh, Mr Agnew. So can I ask, Margaret Rose, as we go through, that you highlight to us where there are really significant changes, and can we do it clause by clause? Should we do clause one and then have some form of discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you again for the opportunity to brief um, members on the, the bill. Um, yes, you have uh, clearly recognised that we have made um, what would appear to be significant changes to what was originally um, put forward by Mr Agnew. Um, and while it's a significant departure from the original bill, uh, the intention is still the same. Um, you know, it is our belief that by amending the bill in this way that it will actually um, make it more likely that a bill can be an effective piece of legislation. And I should explain that these aren't our final amendments. There is still a bit more work to be done on these, particularly around Clause 4. 
um, and that's in relation to planning and um, to the statutory partnership. We do want to um, have further discussions with DE and with the HSSPS. So we haven't got final amendments at this point. Um, now, if you, if you want to turn to the revised bill that, that we have provided, I can give you a rationale for all of the, um, the different parts of each of the, the clauses. If that's, if that's okay. Yeah. So we take you to the first section, um, which is really just referred to uh, or known as the long title, and that that part in itself is not legislation. So that just relates to, um, you know, it's a bill to require cooperation among certain public authorities. Now, the word public authorities, again, is in there as well, but really, I suppose what we're talking about here is, is children's authorities, as defined in uh, clause number seven. Uh, but again, you know, these are, some of these things can be changed. That part's not actually the legislation. But taking us on in then to clause number one. The first clause deals with the purpose of the bill, explaining that it's intended to uh, support the improvement of the well-being of children and young people. And this relates to the point that Daniel Greenberg made to the committee, that it was difficult to ascertain the core objective of the bill, uh, and it would benefit from a purpose clause. Within this, we have used the six high-level policy outcomes as the basis of what we uh, mean by well-being, with the aim of giving it a, a holistic definition. And there's no intention, obviously, to change the strategic outcomes in the current 10-year strategy. These continue to be in place, um, but be, you know, it, it is not appropriate to put outcomes in a strategy into legislation in that way. Um, that's clause number one. Do you want to? Mm. Yep, please. Now, in terms of the six high level, Margaret Rose, you'll know that some people thought um, an alternative to naming the six would be to talk about a strategy that was currently operative, but you've, you've chosen against that. Can I just ask what the rationale was? Well, we took our, our um, guidance really from OLC, and I think the intention was that we would have to actually um, base the bill or, or set out the purpose of the bill. Um, so, what, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to actually say that. Um, this bill is going to support improvements in the well-being of children and young people. So that, and, the, and how are we going to see how those improvements are made? Well, it's the improvements in the well-being of children. And if it's in the well-being of children, then what do we mean by well-being? Um, and, and that's why the six high-level outcomes <coughs> were considered, but you know, weren't deemed appropriate actually to be set out in legislation in the way they are in a strategy. Uh, but that actually what we have now are, um, well, it, it, it's de not definitions, but it's um, if you talk about the physical and mental health of a child, for example, it's easier to um, actually measure what we mean by the physical and mental health. So that, and that and all of these will bring us back to the well-being of the child, which is the purpose of the bill. Okay. And these six high-level strategies are in, uh, outcomes are in the children's strategy. They're in the children's strategy. And there will, sooner rather than later, bans are delivered, there will be a new children's strategy. Uh -huh. So can we assume that the six high-level outcomes remain and transfer across? Well, no, no, they may not remain. They may be new, but there but will then, be provision in the bill then to amend, if we need to amend any of our um, any of the areas we have covered within the definition of wellbeing. You have that facility. Would that be a commitment from the department that you, if you did change the high-level outcomes in the strategy, that this bill would be amended accordingly? There's an actual power. There should be a power within the bill to, by regulations, amend if required. Isn't that the we, yeah, we would hope that um, th there wouldn't be as much need. The development of the new strategy can contain new outcomes, um, but as long as the outcomes link back to those uh, parameters that try to give a, a, a definition, for want of a better word, of well-being, then it will be empowered to do that. So the goal was to not have to change it, but there is power in the legislation to change it should they decide that there's an element of well-being that isn't there, um, but the flexibility is in the strategy. Okay. Members, this is clause one. Are we, are we content, <coughs> broadly? Yeah. Okay. Clause two, so the, please. The second clause is a duty to cooperate to improve wellbeing, and this imposes a duty on all departments, agencies, and other bodies to cooperate with each other and with other children's services providers. 
to improve the well-being of children and young people. Um, it's, a, it's proposed that this duty would go, on, would go beyond the um, government and its agencies and extend to those providing children's services in the community and in the voluntary sector. It wouldn't impose the duty on the community and voluntary sector, but it would mean that um, government must consider those bodies in the delivery of its functions. And then there's also a duty on the executive to make arrangements to promote cooperation. And this is a tangible duty, and that actually reflects the position in the uh, Children Act of 2005, which applies to England and Wales. Um, I mean, I know that there was some concern about the words promote um, cooperation rather than um, actually in, in, um, ensure that people Plans. actually do cooperate. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's very difficult uh, to measure what, uh, how somebody cooperates, or it may not be that difficult, but it doesn't really tell you that much, because what would you measure? Would you measure whether people um, emailed each other, held a number of meetings? Um, it, it, what you need to measure, I guess, is, is the outcome of mm -hmm. what you have actually, um, you know, of, of what your, your cooperation has actually um, um, enabled people to do. We had, um, and sorry, Peter, could I? Just, we we did have a, a, a query in um, about you know, the the issue around promotion or whether it should be an actual requirement. Um, but we really felt that it's um, much much better in legislation to to suggest that promote would be a more tangible, more measurable goal. We can easily see um, whether arrangements are in place. Uh, but in contrast, you know, it'll be very difficult to actually see, um, you know, whether we have um, or what the outcome was by attendance of, of meetings or answering of emails or, or the delivery of joint actions, which is why we we went for promote. I, you know, I have to say, you probably know. I I think promote actually is something you can do out all day without achieving anything. You can promote children's issues, but if you Advanced children's issues, that is measurable. So did you give any consideration to advance rather than promote? We can certainly, we can certainly consider <coughs> and, and um, talk to our OLC colleagues on that as well. Yes. Okay. I think the key thing, Chair, if you don't mind, is um, it's only the executive that is described as promoting it, um, in that they're promoting departments to undertake it. But there's a must all children's authorities, and that includes departments and all agencies, must undertake cooperation, okay. and that's where we plan to measure. So the promote only relates to the executive, executive. itself. Okay. Now, you, you have this phrase, children's authority, and that is defined uh, in uh, Clause 7, the interpretation. Yes. Um, is it just me, or is the absence of the Northern Ireland Commission for Children and Young People uh, a glaring the Northern Ireland Commissioner? Yeah. Uh, well, with that list, um, we, we can't uh, include everyone in that list uh, in terms of, you know, everybody. So that body is made up of departments, their agencies, and then those members of the CYPSP that was included in Mr Agnew's original bill. We also include a term called, uh, just after, when we mention children's authorities, we say other children's service providers. And then that is later defined in Clause 7 as anyone else, basically, who's involved in the sector who might be delivering children's services. So Nikki and other organisations like that, even NGOs, would be caught up within that bracket. So what we are saying is departments and these statutory bodies would have to cooperate and then they must also pay regard and work with those other bodies. We can't really place a duty on non-public bodies, if you like. We can't place a duty on NGOs or private bodies. But what we are saying is anyone who's involved in delivering children's services outside of the government sector, that we should be taking account of what they're delivering. And that goes further than what Mr Agnew had originally suggested. Is, is Nikki not a primary authority in terms of children and young people and services? Yes, but, but they would be caught up in that, that in that, that second definition. Um, we can we can look back uh, because um, we can look at the legislation in terms of when we say department, that doesn't necessarily mean just the department. That would also include NDPPs mm -hmm. and other bodies because, for instance, they would not be uh, separate in statute, if you like. So we say 
um, if you list the Department of Enterprise to an investment in legislation, that also would include the NDBBs that fall underneath them. So there, those bodies would be caught up in that. And likewise, we could consider whether Nikki would already fall underneath that as a body of OFM, DFM, because the department is mentioned. But if they weren't in that first children's authorities bracket, they would be in the second bracket. So we would be cooperating and then we'd be taking their advice and we would be having to pay regard to what organisations like Nikki or other ones who are delivering children's services were doing and bringing them into the cooperation of the strategy. Who takes the lead within the executive? Who takes the lead within the executive? In terms of making this happen. In it'll be, will there be a lead department? Yes. Um, and and the lead, well, at, at this point, the lead department is obviously OFM, DFM, because we are responsible for the children's strategy, um, and and this is all based around the children's strategy. And when we go down to nine departments, who will it be? It'll be Department of Education. That's where children's services primarily are to be. So OFM, DFM will lead the charge and then hand over to mm -hmm. education. Yep. Okay. Members. As I were broadly content. Clause three. Third, um, yeah, the third clause. Just, well, I'm, I'm reserving my position on all of this until we go with, through more detail. But um, Stephen Agnew raises a question about the use of these words. I don't know if it is clause two, but it might be. So far as it's consistent with the proper exercise of its children's functions. Is that clause two? Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. Which he says that he's received advice that that's a get out clause. Yeah. And then he has various amendments to clause two and clause four as consequence of his advice. How would you reply to that? Well, we just this morning got Stephen's um, views on the bill in as well. So that is certainly something that, again, that we want to talk to OLC about. Uh, I mean, it's not the intention <coughs> to be a get-out clause. Um, Peter, you've had discussions with Stephen as well on that. Yeah, well, certainly, that phrase reflects what Mr Agnew had in his first yeah. bill. In his first bill, he talked about the Northern Ireland departments must ensure that so far as it is consistent with the proper exercise of their functions. So he had a very similar phrase in his. Now, whenever we spoke to OLC... I wouldn't... I wouldn't um he might have got that wrong and he's now regretting it. No, absolutely, absolutely. We take that point. But we, we, whenever we talk to OLC about this, um, the point is that there are no, departments uh, have a range of functions and duties, and uh, they might not all be specifically to do with children and young people. For instance, DSD might deliver, you know, the benefit system, which is set in law, the OE and their planning functions. There are things out there that are in statute and legislation already that, because we introduce a duty, that they should consider that children and young people shouldn't affect what they should already be doing in legislation and we wouldn't expect because um, they must be cooperating on the well-being of children and young people that they should then have to alter how they already do their business. What we're trying to do in the legislation is saying when these departments or agencies or uh, statutory bodies are delivering children's services or doing something for the well-being of children, that is when the the, um, the cooperation duty should kick in, not whenever they're delivering other functional business that may not necessarily um, impact, because that wouldn't be appropriate. We don't see it as a get-out clause. We just see it and as an appropriate qualification, if you like, um, that not all these departments, their primary function isn't about the well-being of children and young people. There are definitely elements of their business that would impact on it, and it's whenever they're delivering those functions, those children's functions, as we define within the legislation, that they should be thinking about cooperation. Um, but certainly, it's it's not meant to be a get-out clause at all, it, and it was certainly something that obviously Mr. Agnew ha had in his first draft in terms of, you know, the drafters think that this is appropriate in terms of a legislative term that just makes sure that, that <coughs> departments out there who might be delivering services to business or uh, funding departments, that they suddenly don't have to stop their core business and think about the impact of children and young people on every single issue. Well, I'll read the Hansard to try to fully understand that. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, like, if the competence of the bill is in relation to children cooperation, then it seems to me that you're stretching a point to then argue, well, there'll be departments and not all their functions will relate to children, and therefore you're trying to draft clauses that make sure that the department 
to you to cooperate or the authority to you to cooperate is in relation to the children's function, not in respect of other function. Now, that seems to me to be stretched in argument in a way that I don't know is is that sensible. But I'll read the answer and speak to Stephen and uh, and reserve my position. I also say I agree with the chair that um, I don't know if the executive's role is to merely promote as opposed to advance. I don't know how you can differentiate the executive's function in that regard from the uh, responsibilities of the children's authorities. I would think, in fact, the executive's function is to advance like with other children's authorities. Are we saying that the executive's function is a lesser one of promotion? I don't think so. But that certainly wasn't our intention. Aye, um, but that's, you made that dif point of differentiation. I'm only picking up what you said. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I can take, take your point that advanced maybe is a much more appropriate word because the intention was not to minimise the level but to distinguish between the two. So advanced, you know, we can certainly have that considered in the memo. Right. Close three. Clause three, then. Um, the third clause introduces a duty on the executive to adopt a children and young people strategy. Um, you know, you're already aware, of course, that there is a, the, the current 10-year strategy. We have begun work on um, the new strategy. Um, so the bill, this bill would actually place the need for that, strate that strategy onto a statutory footing and provide another tangible example, we think, of how cooperation was happening. Um, because because this clause gives the focus on the duty to cooperate, it means that departments and relevant um, departments, um, and sorry, all departments and relevant partners, would actually cooperate with each other to prepare and implement the strategy. So we think that that has um, maybe gone a little bit further than what the original um, bill, bill was suggesting. Uh, the clause also details what would be expected to be included within the strategy. It also sets out the requirement to consult with children and young people, parents and guardians and representative groups before the adoption of the strategy. But you know, unless, I want to just be very clear on this point that this in no way removes the overall principle of consultation on policy development. Um, that, that the overall principle remains the same, but we just wanted to be very clear here that we wanted to see consultation with children very much um, in, you know, embedded in that. So the new, oh sorry, that's, that's clause three. Um, yep, yeah, that's basically what Clause 3 then is saying. Does this bring on any further consultation requirements on the department than you already have because you are working on the strategy? Mm -hmm. No, it shouldn't bring on any additional ones, but it's just to be absolutely clear that within developing the strategy that there is uh, the references there that, um, and, the, and the clear uh, evidence there that children have been consulted and their parents and guardians have been consulted. At 4C and 4D, Margaret Rose talks about uh, the per such persons as the executive thinks appropriate. Oh, a 3, 4, <clears throat> uh -huh. um, What does that mean? Who, who would be appropriate? Well, it, I, I suppose that is a, a catch-all. If there were any people that we had missed in the uh, the general consultation, we, we considered the parents and guardians, we considered the children and young people themselves, but there could be other. Um, give you any examples, Peter? Yeah, the, the, this this wording sort of reflects what's um, legislative precedent in the children and young people's plan and the regulations, and which are in enforce in England in the 2005 regulations, which talks about consulting with children and young people, parents, guardians, groups, and others, if you like. So it really is just to try and show the importance of the consultation in this, and we really wanted to include the children and young people to with regard to UNCRC and our rights underneath that piece of legislation that we should be taking the views of children and young people. And then once we say that, then it's important then to say parents and children, uh, parents and guardians, representatives and others. Now, as, as Margaret Rose has said, that doesn't uh, mean that our existing uh, consultee list is ignored or our requirements under section 75 are ignored it's just trying to show that the consultation um, should be including all bodies who we think are appropriate and it should be a wide and, and useful consultation and would that include the relevant elements within the community and the voluntary sectors yes. absolutely yes okay okay members um just around clause three and 
taking three and four together for a minute, um, would there be two separate consultations for the strategy and the plan, or will they be consulted on together? Well, the strategy would have to be produced before the plan yeah. is produced, so the strategy would be produced and signed off by the executive, and then so it could be some considerable time, not no, hopefully not some considerable time, but there could be some time between when the strategy is produced and then the, the plan is produced. That's the point I was going to make. It seems like there will be a lot of devisings of strategies and plans and consultations of both, and it'll be a long time before it actually got to any sort of implementation. I suppose there's a difference in the, when we talk about the plans, there's the, there's the implementation plans and then there's the, just the service delivery plans that organisations currently produce in any case. So the, there's a need, I think, to uh, differentiate between the two. The strategy will produce an implementation plan as well, but then the um, clause four, when we get to it, uh, we will talk about it's almost like the service delivery plan that we're into. So there's two, there's two different types of plans, really. What's the difference between them? One is really about service delivery. One, the implementation one would be at a higher level to suggest that, um, you know, the, these, like any normal implementation plan that would come out from government, um, when you look at the service delivery plans, for example, some of the trusts might have, they are much more into the detail of um, some of the actions that they will have to take around delivering particular services. Um, at the moment, the uh, Children and Young People's Partnership along with the, the Health and Social Care Board, produce a, a delivery plan under Clause 4 of the Children Order. And I, and I guess you know, the, this, the plan within Clause 4 of our order is an extension of that plan, almost, uh, because it's to and, you know, capture all the other elements of the children's strategy, not just the, the children order. So it's a, it's a different type of plan. So yes, there will be uh, further consultation, as there currently will be the new that the children and young people that the children and young people strategic partnership will consider the the plan for delivering under clause for the children order in the same way that uh, they will consult then in the same way when they go to develop the plan for under this order so there's kind of two stages of the consultation there okay yeah. thanks well, it just, it's just to confirm what the chair was uh, was pointing up, the reference to children, parents, guardians in terms of consultation is for emphasis, but it is not to exclude any wider legal or desirable consultation. And going back to your very first point, um, in the event that the six outcomes are changed or is proposed to change, there will obviously be consultation with children, advocacy groups, and so on and so forth. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the outcomes c could only be changed when we're developing the new strategy. And in developing the new strategy, there will be full consultation within that. I, I, I get what you're saying, Margaret, you, when you say you need a strategy before you can have a plan. But I just want to note that in the commencement at 8, you have the same deadline for the two, uh, both the strategy and the first plan being laid before the Assembly. I think. On the we, same we, deadline. So I think we need to look at, at that again. Yeah. Oh, you do. Well, yeah. It, the ah. commencement. Sorry, the commencement date is the date for the commencement of this bill. Yes, but then you say the first strategy, which is the one we've just discussed in three, uh -huh. the first plan, which we're about to discuss, must be laid before the assembly before the end of the period of twelve months, beginning with the day in which the act receives royal assent. So they both. Both the strategy and the plan. But hopefully, the strategy would be developed. Um, you know, around, uh, we're certainly into the early of ne early yes. next year. The need to develop the strategy has already started because the the current one ends in 2016. So regardless of whether the, the private members' bill goes through or not, um, I, I have a requ requirement to produce a new strategy. So that strategy should be. Um, to a position where hopefully we will get agreement on it by the time the bill is ready to be enacted. Okay, so we go to four then, which is the plan. Uh -huh. well, this replaces the previous clause four. Now, I mean, we we <coughs> had some discussions with DE in particular about this and um, with DHSS as well, um, and we still don't think that this does what we wanted it to do. You know, we're we're still trying to work out what. Um, the services plan should look like. 
Uh, so much of this is based on what's currently in the Children Order 2004, which, as you know, is very specific to children in need. Um, and, and we want to be clear in this that we're not asking. Um, it might be the children and young people's or young people's strategic partnership who end up doing the plan, but we don't want to be asking them to do a delivery plan that covers absolutely everything. You know, we need to be kind of more precise, I think, in, in what it is that we're asking for here. So we do have a bit of more work to do on this one. Um, but the, the current clause, the, cur the clause four that we have produced now, um, places a requirement on the executive to adopt the services plan. And while we're saying that it will detail how children's services will be planned, commissioned, and delivered, we do think we need to put a few, um, you know, be more precise there about what children's services we're talking about here. Okay. Well, can you? I'm going to ask you to guide us, Margaret Rose. We are scheduling um, our clause by clause for next Wednesday. Is there any point? Including the current clause four. Well, I mean, I, I, in, in our view, um, we don't think that the current clause four is what we want um, to to see ended up in the in the in the bill. So um, it's not going to make the cut. Hmm. Not in no, its current. Not in form. its current. So form. to answer your question, it may not be um, because we wouldn't want. A, it is quite detailed, and that's what our fellow departments have raised with us that they have concerns about. Yeah. So we would want to improve it in a way that's effective before yeah. you. I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm not being critical. I'm just looking for information, and you know, it's, it's unlikely you'll have your solid state clause four by yeah. next week. So Wednesday. I think best not. Uh, we'll be, so yeah. obviously, our timelines in terms of our Aye. midi stage will not permit us to do the complete job that we would have preferred to do. But that's just where we are. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. Do you, do you have any uh, initial comment on uh, draft clause four three as proposed by you in his paper, as a w as a way of um, helping you and OLC get through this? Sorry, as a way out of. As a way of helping you and OLC get through this. Clause four three: Every children's authority must cooperate. Yes. With the executive in the preparation of the plan. Um. And so far as it's consistent with the proper exercise of function, exercise those functions in accordance with the plan. No, you're referring to Mr. Ivey's original bill. Sorry, Peter, do you have that? Um, I got the original. Consistent word again. <laughs> he deletes the consistent. Don't, so, don't you have to answer that question? No, I won't yeah, again. No, don't does worry. Does that refer to this um, CYPSP or this no, it's a sort partnership? Of a shortens it. No, we, we've only been shared with these this morning, but we will take them to OLC and sort of consider them again. Now, I think the point around clause four is again, who's doing this planning? Is it should it be the executive or should it be someone else? And is there too much detail there, or should we try and cut back? And because the more detail we put there, sort of uh, the trickier the job might be in terms of the services planning. So it's something to consider again. Um, but we are working with our uh, colleagues in the Department of Health and the Department of Education to see what should be appropriate there. And, and explain to me, sorry, Chair, but explain to me why is there an issue about who prepares? Well, I suppose, uh, sorry, I suppose uh, Mr. Agnew's initial intention in this bill was to place the CYPSP onto a statutory footing. Uh, and that wasn't actually achieved in its first draft, and that is still something that we need to consider whether or not that body could be placed onto a statutory footing, and therefore the planning function would be placed onto them, possibly. But at the minute, it's at the executive at a higher level because that gives the potential to delegate it to their appropriate department or body, given the changes that are going on and, and the restructuring and things like that. Um, but. There's wider issues, I suppose, you know, just that we need to tighten up on clause four to make sure that it is going to deliver what we want it to deliver so that the strategy is setting out uh, what we want to achieve and the plan is then explaining how we're going to achieve that through services planning. Are all the other uh, clauses in the bill, are they committee ready as you see it? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the majority of them are. There are a few. Um, a few changes I think we, think we might want to make, um, but again, um, talking with the Department of Education in particular, I think there, there might be just some things we want to tighten up on. But you know, as far as uh, the, the vast majority of it, I think we are reasonably yeah. content with. Class four would have been on planning would have been the key one that we wanted to tighten up. We were conscious of your own timeframes, mm -hmm. and we we at least wanted to get initial draft amendments to you to let you see in detail. The direction of travel. Are there are there sub clauses in draft clause four 
that you think are committee ready? The reason what can be concern is, is that we're, we end up losing time and um, we have a hard deadline, we can't shift it. Aye. We've already taken our extension Aye. for uh, committee consideration of the bill, so we cannot go beyond our deadline. So are you saying that, that there will, it is likely there will be amendments beyond Clause 4? It, could it is be, likely, yes, yes, it is. It likely. could be uh, two further additional clauses, but they address, I believe, what uh, Mr Atwood is um, referring to in Mr Agnew's original Clause 4. But I, forgive me, I don't have a copy of the original with me, so I can't. Um, but we are, the original purpose of the bill aimed at um, empowering uh, the statutory provider, the statutory partnership. So we are discussing with uh, CYPSP and the Department of Health and the Department of Education how could a statutory partnership operate and be effective. Now, I'm not suggesting a new body. This is within right. current resources. So we're trying to tie that down and make it an effective clause that it, it would exist. And the next stage would then be that that statutory partnership would be enabled to develop the plan and deliver the plan because that partnership would um, be made up of members of the Health and Social Services Board, the Trusts, hopefully the Education Authority and then every any other agency within departments that are needed to be at the table to provide integrated service delivery for children. Does that help? It, no, that actually does help. Um, I'm trying to work through my mind where are there such precedents for a statutory partnership? Um, we have. And, and they, they, they exist? They, they do exist. We have found a few um, it, it, across the water. The concept is used, but that's what I'm trying to explain. We're trying to get into it in more detail um, and research what happens there, and whether it can be, whether it can work effectively here. So that's why there's no actual amendment at the minute because we're still developing it and trying to test it to see will this be an effective body to operate. Okay. We, I'm conscious of time. Clause 5, Margaret Rose. Clause 5 deals with the pulling of uh, funds. And this still reflects Mr Agnew's original clause, um, just with a few minor amendments to the wording. <coughs> the clause is, remains an enabling power rather than a, an actual duty. And we remain of the view that, you know, to compel bodies to pull funds might be problematic, um, both in legislation and in practical terms. And we think it's more effective to provide bodies with the power to act in this way if they identify the need uh, and agree how their budgets might be or could be utilised uh, to support shared objectives. So there hasn't been that many amendments to that clause, um, you know, from, from Stephen's original. Although I think there might be another amendment that we might need to make, um, and that would be the power for um, departments or bodies to form a fund in the first instance, as well as to actually pull the budget. That's just a technical. Okay. Um, um, there was a there was a concern raised, particularly I think by Nilga, the local government association, about the tension between what might, might be happening through this and the council's power. Uh, of delivering well-being. Um, have you resolved that tension, do you? No. No, we still haven't done the questions. Um, but again, we're hoping, I, I was at a CYPSP meeting on Friday where I had hoped the council officials would be there so that we could open discussions on that. Because again, we would hope that this duty complements the development of community planning as opposed to... Uh, Any conflict with it? Okay. Can we, I, think, I think we'll go straight to six if, if members are content. Chair, I just check on that one. Uh, similar to other clauses, the reference to children's authorities, that does include um, government departments. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's in seven. Seven, that's uh, Interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Grant. Clause seven was set out of So, well, okay, I think we'll finish on this one on six because we've touched on interpretation and also on commencements. Okay. So, the clause six relates to reporting, um, and this was a, a clause I, I think the most people were concerned about um, um, as, as well at the, the last um, committee session here. 
Um, the clause as it sits now requires the executive to prepare a report on the operation of the Act. And that, this will provide a range of information, including the actions taken to achieve um, the outcomes listed in the strategy, the progress on achieving those outcomes, and how the well-being of children and young people has improved. Um, we already had concerns, as you know, regarding the purpose of the reporting in Mr Agnew's clause, and we felt that there was too much focus on reporting on process rather than on the actions taken. So whilst there are elements in this report on how cooperation has happened and how it could be improved, the focus is more on delivery and the impact on the lives of young people. So we see this report as being more um, an overarching um, report at the end of three years as to how it our strategy has actually impacted on the, the, the lives of children and young people. And we we're still proposing that the formal reporting should take place every three years, but that is not to say or suggest that you, there wouldn't be any um, annual reporting could, that could be carried out at a more local level. Because you know, currently, the Children and Young People's um, Strategic Partnership report on an ongoing basis on their website on a whole range of indicators related to the high-level incomes outcomes. Um, and there is really the potential to develop that system to enhance the availability of that information. Um, and then every three years, you know, you could do that. The, uh, the, the, the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership could continue to do that, and then every three years a formal report will be uh, prepared, which could be scrutinised by the relevant stakeholders, including the Assembly. Um, Jim, you have some really good examples of... of um, you know, at a very local level, how the uh, current reporting mechanisms within the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership actually um, yeah, helps to change things yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Forgive me if I, I should have brought more with me today, but at the meeting last week, um, it was explained to me how the partnerships outcomes groups, which I believe there are ten in Northern Ireland, at a very local level, and their locality locality groups work, and they're on a geographic basis. Um, each locality group has a locality coordinator from the board and in the statistical information that their website identified, it brought in an issue on um, achieving qualifications in a particular area in Armagh. Um, the look, because that information was available um, at a very local level, um, the coordinator was able to contact the schools involved, or the schools in the area, and ask was there something that could be done at a local level. Um, and the young people, it was actually a boys', boys schools, um, were also involved in that, would they like help? Um, that transpired that um, the outcomes group was able to provide a tutor for a, a small period of time um, in a facility. It was actually held, I think, in a community centre rather than in the school to support those young people to get through their uh, GCSEs. So it was a small term, solution, a short solution, but it assisted at a local level because the analysis in, in the um, reporting had identified that. So it was quite effective. And when it was reported back to other locality groups, then they were interested in saying, well, that seemed to work for you and we'll look at it. So I felt that that was a good example of how at a sl small level, um, they were look the reporting was helping to identify local issues and address them. Okay. Well, Rose, you said that, that the report would deliver or so would assess the delivery of the strategy. Mm -hmm. Does it also is it also going to report on one two on the the six high level outcomes? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, yes. I mean that. Yeah, because six high, high level outcomes will be in the strategy. Yes. Based on the strategy. Okay. Members content. Chair, Mr. Chair, is there any agreement over the frequency with which the report should be given? There's a lot of Debate that it should be one year rather than three years. Well, it, yeah, well, that's what we're, we're suggesting still three years, but that doesn't preclude, you know, um, a reporting mechanism continuing on a yearly basis. The, the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership already do. Um, well, there's ongoing reporting because the website's available and you can utilise it at any time. They produce a one-year report, and I'm assuming, well, they would be proposing to continue with that. If they develop into the partnership, it would be up to them to decide do they want to produce a formal one-year report. Sure, but the purposes of this report is to report on how the executive and government departments have cooperated, not just the children's uh, strategic partnership. Yeah, but that, that's back to the point about a statutory partnership. By then, it, the statutory partnership will not exclude any element of children's services, so it will be reporting on everything. So that's in the strategy. You could foresee uh, that body reporting on executive 
uh, cooperation or otherwise? It would be re report. Well, it would be reporting on departmental cooperation, which is the requirement, the duty. Um, yes, okay. and if it's reporting on departments, then that's the executive by default. Okay. Uh, sorry, we, we, we touched on seven and eight. But I think Megan would like to raise something on seven. Just quickly, mm -hmm. um, seven section one. Um, is there a need for CCMS to be named? Or does the education authority not cover that? Uh, this is something, again, we'll have to consider with our legislative drafters. Um, again, going back to the point earlier about if we name a department that includes their NDBBs and other bodies that maybe aren't listed in statute, our understanding of the minute and from our first draft of the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools is a separate statutory body, and therefore, if we just said Department of Education or just said the Education Authority, it wouldn't be bound by the legislation, but again, we can look into that and we want to seek clarification on whether or not uh, that body does need to be included, or other bodies such as the housing sector, things like that. But um, if we, if if it is a separate statutory body, and we want to include them, they would need to be named separately, as our understanding at this stage. Anyway. Okay, and um, just finally, subsection three of seven um, around in relation to disabilities and people under the age of 21. Um, it's just really to clarify if that would affect their ability to access adult services or is it merely allowing for inclusion for children's services? You know, for example, a 20-year-old visually impaired person. That's actually one of yeah. uh, sorry. Nope. That's one of the issues that um, DE raised with us last week, and we are, and we have to change that. I mean, that that isn't right actually at the okay. moment. So we need to um, just think very carefully about that section because obviously. Uh, well, it's just not written. It's not the way we had intended it. Okay. So that will change. The, the goal was that young people, in particular circumstances, are slipping through in that they're not treated as children, but they're not treated yeah. as they need to be as adults. And so we trying to make sure that any transition is captured. That was the aspiration. But I think Margaret Rose, I would have to work on it further. OK, thanks. OK, June and Peter and Margaret Rose, thank you very much indeed. If you have any updates for us for next Wednesday, we'd appreciate it, but we understand we will not have sight of thank you very much. a solid-state uh, bill. So, uh, members, just to emphasise, next Wednesday we will have to um, make firm decisions with the information that is available uh, to us. and. Um, as it clearly will not be possible to do the, the sort of clause by clause scrutiny that, that we would have required, uh, I think we will be limited to um, a committee report that talks about whether or not we're content with the broad direction of, of travel. But we will have to start off next week. We, have, we went for an extension to the, the standard committee stage period, and you cannot extend the extension. As us. So finally, for today, uh, we have a briefing from departmental officials uh, on the programme for government, uh, performance 1415, and these are commitments 15, 16, 17, 26, 33, 38, 41, and 77. So, Tony Canavan will join us, Margaret Rose uh, returns to the table, Sean Broderick joins us, and Henry Johnson. So, Henry. Okay. I'll uh, give a sort of short, uh, short uh, uh, opening sort of remarks, hopefully cover some of the uh, main points and then we'll one question. So, uh, thank you, Chair, for uh, the invitation to attend today and the opportunity to update you on uh, today. Uh, on those programme for government commitments, which I'm now the SRO for. Um, and we'll cover today uh, PFG 15, which is the develop the Maze Lawn Cash generation site, 16, which is developed the, the One Plan and Derry London Derry, 17, uh, which is provide financial and other support across government to, to the culture, 26, uh, which is the 20% competitive drawdown target, 33, which is the childcare strategy. 34, and our contribution to it, which uh, prime responsibility falls to Mark. 38, around uh, age discrimination uh, legislation. And 77, which is the post-2015 um, structures of government. Uh, you'll note in your papers, and you uh, hopefully skirted over what that uh, commitment 41 
in relation to the advisory group, uh, which has been finished, is ascribed to me, should actually be Mark. Sorry for that. Yes. Deemed and, complete. Okay. In relation to the outstanding commitments on Commitment 15, there is currently no agreement on the May's long cash. The MLK targets up to the end of the PFG uh, period uh, are not achieved, as in previous quarters, and Ministers continue to discuss a way forward with the regeneration of the site. However, MLK uh, Development Corporation continues to meet its responsibilities with regard to the maintenance, health and safety of the site and commitments to the RUAS, but there is no redevelopment on the site. Uh, in relation to Commitment 60, 16, uh, to develop the one plan. Uh, the targets in there were challenging, but progress has, has been made. The development and regeneration of Abrington continues with a number of additional buildings on the site, opening for business shortly and one having just opened. The department continues to work with ILEX to maximise investment. Overall, £16.5 million pounds of the envisaged £23 million pounds has been invested on the Abrington site due to delays in getting the Everton development framework complete and slippage with a number of capital projects, particularly in 1415. That said, the, the Wall City Brewery has now opened in Building 70 with the creation of 10 jobs. Building 8081 has been refurbished and is now a creative industries hub to help small businesses grow. Uh, in addition, a combined coffee and bicycle workshop will open later in the summer. These ventures are the first new businesses operating permanently on the site and will hopefully pave the way for further enterprise. In addition, DOE has leased Building 71 uh, on Abrington and set up a regional office for the Minister and the Chief Planner. The Abrington Development Framework has also been now completed. It is envisaged that this will ultimately lead uh, to an approximately an additional uh, 1,800 jobs in the city and an additional gross value add of £42 million. There has been extensive consultation on the framework with local stakeholders to try and ensure it reflects the needs of the surrounding community. The framework was submitted for planning approval in December 14 and subject to normal planning approval processes. Uh, we uh, anticipate approval later in the summer. ILEX is actively engaging with the private, public, community and voluntary sectors to acquire tenants for Embryton. Currently there are 62 formal expressions of interest establish potential businesses on the site. Alex has been asked to prioritise the redevelopment of Abridon and will now focus on facilitating opportunities for new or expanded businesses to develop at Abridon in line with the outcome of the Abridon development framework. Alex is focusing on the regeneration of Abridon and bringing the site's historic buildings back into use. This only, it not only safeguards them for the future, but will promote jobs on the site. In terms of job creation, uh, there were uh, challenging targets in the programme for government, uh, and very positively they were uh, exceeded in 2012-13 and 13-14. However, the job promotion target for 14-15 was 1,200 new jobs promoted in the city, uh, and that was obviously challenging in the fragile financial environment. Year-end returns from, from Invest uh, Department, Gary City Council, show that uh, only 861 jobs have been promoted, which is only 70 per cent of the target. However, uh, an additional 113 jobs have been safeguarded, 35 R&D jobs uh, at, at uh, Seagate have been created. Overall, on the PFG target uh, for the three years, the total number of the jobs promoted amounted to 3,700, or over uh, 90 per cent of the target of 4,045. Other one plan catalyst programmes are continuing, with um, leads now in place for 10 of the 11 programmes. The Dairy Lutton Dairy Strategy Board, uh, which is co chaired by Hilex and more recently the Dairy Straban Council, is charged with the successful delivery of the one plan and meets quarterly to review progress and advance key projects. The Northwest Regional Sands Park is a satellite of the highly successful Sands Park in the Titanic Quarter. Construction began in July 13 and the project was completed in August 14. The facility is now 90 per cent occupied, which exceeded expectations. Uh, as we previously reported to the committee, PFG 17 Sports City of Culture has been completed. The committee was recently briefed uh, on the Child Care Strategy Commitment 33, and Margaret Rose will be happy to respond to any further questions you have on it 
or in relation to our contribution um, to uh, Commitments 34. Commitments 38, age GFS legislation, remains under consideration in the Department, but could still potentially be put on the statute books this Assembly term, subject to uh, necessary agreements. Commitment 77 in relation to post-15 structures of government is progressing with a view now to being implemented in time for the new Assembly term in, in May uh, 2016. And finally, uh, I understand that last week Mark explained the new reporting format with the central team I promulgated uh, and you'll note that uh, my like marks are in the format. So thanks for, for your patience and I'm happy uh, to respond to questions. Okay. Uh, let's start with the last one, the um, post-2015 government structures. You know, Tony is a frequent visitor on a Monday upstairs to the Stormont House Implementation Group. I will not ask for your impressions of that, Tony. Um, but are all these changes um, linked and predicated on agreement and implementation of Stormont House? Sorry, didn't catch that. Your impression. Can we go, for example, from 12 departments to nine? Yeah irrespective of Government House agreement? Um, I mean, there are political issues there as to whether politicians want to tie other aspects of the Government House agreement in with it. Work is proceeding, certainly, on the basis of moving to nine departments in May 2016. And, I mean, there's an agreement on nine. We have the titles of nine. The titles for it. It was all set out in the uh, First Minister's statement on the 2nd of March. Uh, the nine titles and, in broad terms, what is transferring from one department to another department. So the next big piece of work, presumably, is the functionality of the nine departments. What's happening in, in that regard? Well, the functionality in the sense of, of knowing what should be moving from one department to another is happening. Uh, there is a lot of work going on uh, on the administrative changes that would be needed in terms of finance, uh, staff moves. Uh, accommodation issues like that. That's the subject of a, a major programme which spans all of the Northern Ireland departments is being led by the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Employment and Learning. Uh, and that has been operational since February. Uh, there are about a dozen projects going on underneath that. One of the projects uh, is uh, the legislation project that I'm involved in. And that project is looking at the development of a bill uh, which will uh, create the legal framework for the nine new departments and also for a more complex transfer of functions order, which will actually change the legislation so that uh, the new departments will have the statutory responsibilities which will transfer. And uh, work is proceeding in all departments at the moment on the preparations for the transfer of functions order. Okay. There's a separate project created for, for each of the new departments with an allocated SRO who's taken uh, forward the, the work both in relation to the formation of the, their new department and, in our case, uh, transfer of, of functions to uh, something like six uh, of, of, of the new departments. Well, I'm, I'm going to shamelessly abuse my position and I put in a, a plug to make, ask you to make sure that coastal management, including coastal erosion, falls to a department because I believe it falls across five or six departments currently. The policy is a handwritten scrap of paper by a civil servant called Bateman, written in the late 1960s, in which he assesses it not to be a priority. Uh, but if you live in Ballywalter and the, the road collapses uh, under the weight of a storm, uh, it does impact 24-7 on your, on your daily lives. Um, Henry, did we t are, are you... Doing the drawdown of competitive EU funds? Yes, and on terms of 26, we've now achieved the 20% the target. I think Mark uh, alluded last time to a, a more um, ambitious uh, target uh, moving, moving forward into the next PFG period. So what about this extended PFG period? Is there a, is there a target there is a for this year? There is a post target in the, um, in the draft PFG for 15-16, which has not yet been agreed. Okay. Okay. What about benchmarking? Uh, Mark Brown told us that thinking is changing in terms of, of benchmarking. Uh, yes, there's. Um, we commissioned some some work from from NISRA looking at benchmarking. I think the the um, 
a number of uh, individuals and, and organisations have said that really what we need to do in terms of benchmarking isn't to look at member state benchmarking. What we need to look at is let's look at look at regions. Let's try to find a region similar similar to here and do do the comparison uh, to uh, to that region. NISRA did a significant amount of work. One of the things, sources they, they looked at was the large database uh, which uh, the Commission hold in relation to uh, uh, grants. They were unable, really, to come up with a, a satisfactory source of information which would allow us to do uh, a, a sensible, uh, sound and little comparison between what we, had, what we had achieved and what other regions had done. So that, that, that didn't work. We had, we had high hopes that that might have worked. So what, what, I think that the approach which uh, now adopted is to try to use informal networks into other uh, regions and to build on, on networks which, for, for example, the uh, office in, in Brussels has established with the likes of, of Flanders and Bavaria and so on, and, and to use the, those networks to get, to get a better feel. Uh, we, we've been aware that some member states seem to be resistant in terms of uh, divulging information at a regional level and are only prepared to, to disclose at a, at a national level, and that may be why as we're un unable to really come to any sound, sound uh, analysis in terms of that compa uh, comparative work. Okay, thank you. Let, let me skip to the, to the one plan. Um, we were hearing in, in the chamber um, on the, the latest north-south ministerial uh, meeting and plenary session the, the, the refer to the, the North West Gateway initiative. Is there any connectivity between that and, and the one plan? Um, well, we're aware of the North West Gateway, um, but the one plan and ILEX, as you know, the one plan is a wider development programme, really a framework, and it will be subsumed within the community plan, which is presently being developed by the new council. So. The one plan will be subsumed but within the next coming year into that new community plan. And what you have is the North West Gateway with the same people around the table looking how you bring that all together, essentially. So that's really how they're connected. So you have the main players at the table at the same time. So the one plan will cease to be the responsibility of OFMDFM? Well, the executive committee? If well, the one plan, really, when it deals with what, what is really a development framework for the Derry City Council, will, I think, be subsumed within the community plan, which Derry, Derry and Strabane District Council must bring forward by April next year. Now, there's the issue around urban re regeneration, which, as you know, is subject of legislation presently before the Assembly, and it, the plan is for it to be devolved to the Council by April next year. But that will be dependent on the legislation going through at, at a pace. But not the Aberton site it, it, it itself. The intention was that that, that would um, not go across the, the current so, at least. No, the Aberton site is owned by OFMDFM. ILEX is a company that we have established that will develop the site. So that is where we are um, currently. ILEX has had its problems in the past. Has it had a comfortable year? Um, I think we work hard with ILEX um, for it to, to deliver on the capital spend and it has brought forward new plans to ensure that it will spend within the coming year up to the maximum of its capital spend, which is £2.8 um, and we're working with them to deliver on that. I think in terms of the 14-15 uh, year, they had significant challenges in delivering on, on capital spend and I think when Mark and Stephen were here talking about probably our, our budget outturn, it was saying we, we had a, a capital underspend. Um, one of the contributions to, to that uh, was, was ILEX, where they uh, had some of the developments they were, they were taking forward on the site, um, which, which meant they couldn't uh, spend the money they had envisaged. So there are really three missions going forward. Mm -hmm. The first one is to ensure that the legacy of the one plan is, is taken forward in the context of, of the, uh, the new community plan. And to that end, the, uh, it's, it's hoped that staff from ILEX will, will work, perhaps even seconded in, uh, to the, the new council to, to lead on that. The second thing they need to do is to animate the, the Ebrington site. Uh, and you know, I've, I've talked about some, some of the progress there in terms of the, the microbrewery coming mm -hmm. on stream now and, and other plans coming come to fruition during, during July. And the third thing they need to push ahead with is in terms of their, of their capital spend this year, and we've been working with them and discussing with them what they can do to ensure that the problems they had last year, some of which was about backloaded expenditure, and then when things go wrong, as they always tend to do in building projects, they just need nowhere to go and they can't spend the money. You know, they found a star fort 
Uh, Fort, they found a star fort wall in one of their developments, and obviously then they had to bring the environment agency in because they obviously had to protect that. They found a way to do that and move that forward. They found asbestos in one of the buildings. So, you know, so there are legitimate, legitimate reasons why some of these things slow down. You know, they're going to fill, finish another capital programme, and there was a change of contractors, and so they couldn't finish that in the time frame. So there are legitimate reasons why the capital spend was delivered near the end of the year. But I think obviously we want to work with them to ensure it doesn't happen in this year. So a change in terms of the programme and also see if there's if some smaller projects which they can bring in on short notice to uh, to top up if they run into problems in some of, some of the, the schedules uh, developments. Okay. Let's go to, to 38, please, age discrimination legislation. It was um, back in February, 19th February, junior ministers advised of the intention to bring forward a consultation setting out proposals for legislation on age discrimination. Then this committee was briefed on the 15th of April on the proposed consultation. Uh, it's now past the 15th of June, uh, and there is no consultation. Um, yeah, well, Mark is in an advanced stage on the, the consultation document, and it's, it's under final consideration um, by the department at the moment. Um. Is there any timeline? Is there any? Well, I think we would still be hopeful that it would go out to consultation before the summer recess. And the legislation? Well, again, the legislation is dependent on the policy proposals being agreed. Um, and that obviously, you know, if, if we don't get out to consultation um, in June, and if we get, even if we get out to consultation now in June, um, then obviously we need to provide another month. Uh, at the far end for the, the consultation period. Um, I think our timeline will still be, it'll be tight, it's still possible if um, the policy proposals are agreed in, in the early autumn. Um, there is still the possibility of bringing forward um, a proposal to the committee and to the assembly um, that we could take forward, um, potentially take forward legislation. Would you be that seeking is, accelerated passage? It, it, is, it, it is an option. I mean, obviously, that will be for our, for our ministers to decide following the consultation. Uh, but it is still an option. Yes. I know the the, the chairperson's liaison group was uh, cautioned about the, the the work burden that may be coming over in the the last year of the mandate. So. Okay. And and childcare. Do you want to just recap? I know we've been we've been over this ground recently, Margaret Rose. But any developments? Again, it's a final consideration by the department, um, and, and I think, um, I mean, we would be very hopeful that it would be published shortly for consultation as well. Okay. But the, the, the milestone for 2012-13 was design a programme to achieve 12 million of additional expenditure on improving childcare provision over the CSR. Um, in, in the most recent briefing, the Officials advised us 12 million is for action that is supportive of the development of a childcare strategy. I, I thought the 12 million was was actually for childcare. Well, the 12 million is um, is being used um, primarily for the um, grant scheme. Um, we have the, the, the list of so it, is, it, is it 12 million for childcare provision, or is it 12 million to support the development? Of a childcare strategy. Well, the, the, in, in supporting the development of a childcare strategy, I think the 12 million would be is, is being used to um, uh, for, certainly for the first 15 key actions. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a case that you would spend 12 million pound developing a, uh, in the development of a strategy, but it clearly is the money, the, the funding that's available to do um, you know what we can do in terms of delivering. Um, in this case, in the first instance, school age childcare provision or increasing that provision, and then you know, primarily that's what we're using the, the 12 million for. Well, last week, uh, Mark Brown had to face up to the fact that, uh, with regard to the social investment fund, the, the plan had been to spend 80 million by the 30th of March gone and 79 million effectively uh, rests mm. in the joint bank account of FMDFM. How much of the 12 million for childcare? Uh, equally is, is resting in the bank? Um, up to date now there is, well certainly for this year, from October 14, 1.9 million has been committed. Um, ah, no, to, uh, not, not committed, Margaret Rose spent. Well, yes, well, it, it, in terms of the, um, 
the grant scheme. Um, first key actions one, two, and five are aimed to create up to five or up to seven thousand school aged childcare places. Um, we got seven in the first funding round. We got seventy seven applications. Fifty of those met the selection criteria, and these are worth one point nine million over a three year period. Now, those letters of offer were all issued in December, so those um, um, schemes are all beginning to. Um, uh, yes, but, but with respect, I'm asking how much have you actually spent, not how much have you committed, not how many letters of offer are right. Yep. Uh, I, th I think the wording was design a programme to achieve 12 million of additional expenditure on improving childcare provision. There was a milestone for 13-14, uh, which was achieved at least 3 million of expenditure, and then for 14-15, it was achieved remaining expenditure and the key milestones in the strategy. And no, we did not uh, spend. Uh, tw £12 million. Pounds. I think we have now committed probably something of the order of, of half of that, but our spend would be something um, slightly over £3.4 million. £3.4 OK. Yes, it, now it is, the process of going up, so that may be a slightly old figure, but as, if it's all of that order. It's of that order, that's OK. Megan. Um, it's just on the child care stuff. Um, obviously, child development should be a key consideration in, in any strategy, but how will this ensure places for children of unemployed people or children of people who are in education or training? How will the new strategy? Yeah. yeah. Well, certainly that, I mean, that, that clearly is an issue and will be part of the new strategy coming forward uh, because child development is, I mean, this is a, two, a twin track approach, uh, similar to the, the first uh, 15 key actions. This is about child development as well as about providing uh, the opportunity for people to uh, take up employment. Um, so, and we are mindful, I, I think, uh, of the um, schemes that are available at the moment for people who are in employment, um, but that people who are um, in lower uh, incomes or are unemployed or are at training courses, that there needs to be um, something uh, in place for those as well. And from a labour perspective, obviously, what, what we're hearing on the ground all the time is that even people with even people who are getting financial support, by, whether it be by tax credits, are still spending a huge amount of their income on childcare. So I'm just wondering how it will actually be made more affordable for people in real terms. Yeah, that's one of the, the issues that we need to consider within it. I mean, I, I can't, I, mean, I couldn't give you the, yeah. the, the rationale or the, 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 how that can be done uh, at this point. I think it, during consultation, that'll be one of the issues that we'll clearly have to. Uh, bottom out. The, mo the model that which we, we were advocating in, in terms of the, the first phases of childcare, we're, we're trying to, to reduce the, the, the cost of, of childcare. However, I agree it can be a very high percentage of you know, fam family income in certain cir circumstances. The, the other uh, thing is that there, there has been a, a fair amount of childcare that's been provided at uh, either free or at a peppercorn a cost by uh, you know, a number of, of funders in the past. Uh, there is a difficulty in that some of those funders have now uh, reduced their, their funding into into that area, for, for example, in the, in the area of, of preschool uh, childcare. So that, that's making it uh, less affordable for some individuals. The other challenge we have in terms of the primary thrust of, of Bright Start at the minute, which was actually in uh, in uh, school age childcare, is that some of the delivery organisations uh, who we had assessed as you know, a sustainable organisation, it was it was a it was a package of funding and a package of provision where actually that preschool bit was a pretty pretty important uh, revenue stream and a pretty important not only revenue stream but a use of staff so they were able to sort of uh, stagger them over the day. So that's a challenge for us going going forward. I think. Or do you want to say something about sort of the, the, the wider work you're sort of coordinating? Yeah. In terms of uh, junior ministers, oh, and, and sorry, and, and the the NICPA, um, I mean, at the executive um, junior ministers were um, asked to um, coordinate uh, and to um, liaise with NICPA in terms of the um, funding uh, cuts to a number of voluntary and community organisations and the impact that those cuts were having, particularly on women and children's services. Um, we have had um, meetings with NICPA and. Uh, as part of the um, joint forum, uh, we are meeting with DFP in a, a few weeks' time to see if there is some process that could be put in place whereby departments could be made um, 
and, and you know, at least aware of the impact that uh, the cumulative impact that cuts across a number of departments to specific voluntary and, and community organisations or to the same voluntary and community organisations, that, that that's having a massive impact on some um, organisations because they're getting hit from you know all uh, a number of departments. Uh, so that work is ongoing at the moment. Okay. Alex. Yes, just confirm. This is here. This report is for the period up to the end of fourteen fifteen financial year. Yes. Which is the um, notional end of the programme for government period. Yes. Um, if you analyse the various uh, sectors that you comment on, most of them have comment from you that this commitment is both achievable on the basis of the actions set out in this delivery plan, and so on and so on. If the period is up to the end of 14-15, uh, uh, that's the time period that you're reporting on, should you not be saying in every area where you say, I can confirm this commitment is achievable, should you not be actually saying it hasn't been achieved? Uh, we, we have done, and, I, and my commentary, I was sort of trying to give a slightly more up-to-date up uh, commentary, but if you, if you look at the reports where we, we have not achieved the, uh, the target, by, like MLK, it, we pretty clearly said that. Say but, we haven't it, achieved that. But, but in many other parts of the report, the conclusion that you draw as the senior responsible officer is that I can confirm this commitment is both achievable and so on and so forth. But is the truth not... That at the end of the 14 15 period, at the end of the programme for government period, in every place where you say it is achievable, the truth is that it hasn't been achieved. And should you not be saying that it hasn't been achieved? I think we, we do, uh, or I have said that, where we, ha we haven't achieved the commitment. So, I want you to answer the question now, Henry. At the end, uh, the period 14 15 has ended. Yes. The programme for government period has ended. If at the end of that period, for example, in respect of delivering a range of measures to tackle poverty and social inclusion, uh, if you have not achieved all that you were meant to have achieved, should you not be saying that you haven't achieved it, rather than saying, quote, I can confirm that this commitment is both achievable and so on and so forth? Alex, sorry, so did Rob. Those declarations have gone in the latest reporting mechanism. Mm -hmm. Those that's, have been that's dropped. The, the, that's the old format. Now, we did have various wordings in the old format. There was ones that said, yes, I could confirm it's achievable. Mm -hmm. There are other ones that said, no, I would not achieve it in the timeline. Time so there was, there, was there was a range of wordings. We've done away with that in, in the new, uh, new reporting format. I would say personally, I, I think it's wrong to change your format midstream because it's it's confusing. And I, there's no commentary of that nature. Then. There is no no assessment of progress. There's no senior um, responsible officer declaration anymore. No. And, and well, you you could conclude that for the very I'm reason <laughs> Mr. Axe is raising it. Why was it changed? Uh, uh, was an agreement of the, of the central team that they changed the reporting format. I think Mark oh, has the, tried to explain the rationale when he was here what uh, team? last week. Central team, which is essentially OFM, DFM, with some input from DFP. At a political the, level or so official level? The what? It was an ofi official, suge uh, official suggestion. Officials. So officials decided that I, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll delete, redact the declaration by a senior responsible officer. I'm, I, I'm not here, and I'm going to come back to you whether that was ratified by, by ministers or not. I would assume it was. Either way, it's, it's become it's either an executive decision by officials or it's a decision of the ministers. The reason is why. I, I think Mark tried to explain. Mark, Mark, yeah, Mark, Mark, yes, a very good use of English, Henry. He tried to explain. And, I mean, it, it is the case, as it was with the Social Investment Fund uh, with Dr Brown last week, when we look at Commitment 33, publish and implement a childcare strategy and those milestones of spending £12 million, in terms of progress in quarter four and current position, nowhere, nowhere does it say we have actually spent £3.4 million or money in that uh, ballpark. 
And the SIF doesn't say we've only managed to spend one of the 80 million we committed to spend in the time period. So really, in terms of making these open, transparent and honest, if you don't even include the money you've spent, I think you've failed. I think uh, if, you, if you look at the commitment, there, there's two issues there. Uh, on, in terms of 33, have we achieved uh, all of the milestones and achieved the commitment? The answer is clearly no, we have not. Now, where does it say that? Where does it say we have failed? Well, uh, but however, if you look at the commitment, it says publish and implement the childcare strategy with key actions to provide integrated and affordable childcare. The argument is that Bright Start has been published, but with it within that, that timeline, so we have achieved the commitment, but we have not delivered on all the milestones. And I think uh, my understanding is that when we do report on on PFG progress, uh, we will differentiate between uh, those commitments which were fully achieved, including all the milestones, and those that that may have achieved the commitment but did not achieve all the milestones. And well, the bottom line on Commitment 33 is that you committed to spend £12 million on childcare. And you didn't, and you don't even say we only spent £3.4 million. Well, I think that the, the commitments published and implemented a childcare strategy with key, with key actions. When the, the milestones were, were drafted, they said, well, we're looking at a £12 million programme, because that, that's the amount of money that was, was allocated uh, in the budget period. It said year one, we'll design the programme, year two, we'll, uh, we'll start to spend, and year three, we'll, we'll uh, spend the remaining money. We failed to deliver on those milestones. Will we deliver at least £12 million over an extended period? Yes, we will. Have we got a, a bright start strategy out at the minute? Yes, we have. So we haven't achieved uh, the, the pace of delivery uh, in, in terms of tangible progress on the ground, but we have arguably delivered against the overarching... Well, I would say, Andrew, I wouldn't argue with you if you put in the report, here are milestones, we've failed to achieve them, and here's how badly we've failed. We've only spent 3.4 of the 12. It wouldn't hurt, would it? Uh, I think you know, the information... Would, would it really hurt to say, here's what we, what we spent? Yeah, the information is there in terms of what, what, what we, we spent on, on the uh, fourth, fourth bullet down there on the, on the second page. It doesn't say it should have been nine, but it does say... Second page? Yeah. Fourth um, bullet, one, two, the fourth bullet one says integrated. Okay. Listen, one, two... Interest? Yeah, interest has escaped has been high. These are worth uh, 1.9 million over a three year period and will create a sustain around 1,500. But you said you spent 3.4. Where does it say 3.4? No, that, that's, the, that's the aggregate spend. But, you know, yeah, but that's... In the same way as you could have looked at for the 14, 15 milestone and inferred from it that if you spent 3 million in 13, 14 uh, you, and it but... says achieve remaining expenditure, you would have assumed, having read that, that it was a 9 million pounds. Oh, as Mr Atwood says, this is the final report. This is the fourth quarter of the third and final year of the CSR. So this is the final report. Should well, this, it be? This is the, the G4 report. There will be uh, a final PFG report over the, on the period. I, I just don't see why you can't say we spent 3.4. Well, we, we said that previously. Where? In which one? In front of me, I think Martin. No, no, no. In, in your report, in the, in the same way, Dr. Brown couldn't bring himself to put in, in the report on SIF, we've only spent a million. Sorry, right, Alex, are you? The, um, this decision taken by, at some level, of, in, within FM and DFM and the advice of DFP about what was going to be in the uh, PFG report. Is that done across all departments, as far as you're aware? Uh, it's, uh, it's not my, my, my area, so I, I really prefer not to comment. We'll, co we'll come, come back to it. My understanding is that we change, change, change this reporting format and would have promulgated it around other departments. I'm not clear whether all departments have, have, have used that. I, I can find out and come back to you on that. i just confirm again, when was this decision taken, as far as you're aware, wherever it was taken? Uh, it was taken... March, April. It was very curious timing at the very end of the programme from government period that somehow a critical editorial comment about where the FG commitments are in your department, maybe in other departments, 
but suddenly uh, the rules of the game were changed just at the very end of the EFG. Um, I, I do think you should come back to the committee, though, with, with clarification I, I about the, what else is happening in departments, but also the figures around childcare, because I'm completely in a muddle. On one level, we're being told 1.7 has been spent, on the other level, is 3.4 million. Another, you made some comment, not precisely the precise, precise word, that 3.4 might have been a bit high. I do think. 3.4 might be a bit low. But, well, whatever. We'll come back to I the think we should have factors. some detailed figures about all of that. I think what we will we'll do, just for the sake of clarity, is we'll, we'll come back with uh, figures in relation A to spend and B to the commitments, because we, we have been using both figures, not maybe uh, adding a bit to the, to the confusion. So we, we, will, we will do that. But can I ask you um, one of the areas where you have achieved um, the PFG target? It was always my view that it was far too low. You know what I'm going to say to you. Is a 20% in drawdown of EU funds? It is the nature of the system? I don't expect you to comment on this. To aim low so that you can deliver. Um, and I think that's been proven in respect of EU drawdown. What's the anticipated drawdown for the extra year of the PFG? 15, 16. Um. I think there is a, there's a there is a there is a figure which has not yet yet been been agreed on, on that. So I can't what, comment. What's on. the advice you've given? To <coughs> I think it's it, it's a higher figure than twenty. <laughs> um, well, does that mean twenty one percent, or mean does it mean fifty one percent? I think it's 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 quite uh, quite a significant figure. Probably all suggest that the twenty percent was far too low to begin with. I, th I think it is significant. I think that the twenty percent figure was, was done on the basis of, of really a guess as to as to what the scale of the ambition should be, and it's good that we've actually overachieved in that. I think going forward, one of the things which we might be useful uh, doing, uh, and I know it's been a problem in terms of capturing information as we go along, is that some organisations have been unwilling really to report back. Uh, because uh, we've asked for, for reports back, uh, you know, to populate this sort of thing on a, on a quarterly basis in relation to the actual drawdown. I think other uh, jurisdictions have actually uh, said, well, let's look at the uh, the evidence here. And by and large, most people who get award really bring down the money over the period. They actually look at the value in the award letter and look at the period of the award letter. Now, I think for smaller organisations, they, they might be more willing to say, well, we've been successful in an Erasmus project, you know, it's a two-year project, and we're drawing down you know, X euros, and we could then, we then capture that. So I think that, that might be useful in terms of reporting back information, providing comparable information with, with other, other areas. Uh, but reducing the administrative burden, particularly on smaller organisations. I'll say to you, Henry, I heard that three years ago, that there was um, uh, the, the assessment of what was being drawn down varied uh, between jurisdictions, and there was a difficulty in getting details. And here we are two or three years later, and it is the same. Well... I don't know what that is, if it means that you just, there's some problems you can't resolve, or it's another failure of government or failure of politics. Can I ask you a question? Um, was, was the advisory group on welfare reform that was established? It was. And it's concluded its work. And it's not, having done its initial report, is it not reporting on an ongoing basis? No. That says an awful lot, doesn't it? And on the issue of welfare reform, having had a commitment to report under the PFG, that advisory group was then abandoned. That may well have been what was intended under the PFG, but it does say an awful lot about how that issue has been looked upon in certain places. Okay, Alex. Um, Bronwyn McGowan. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you for your presentation. Henry, just look in clarification on the current position, um, the third bullet point where it talks about a number of provo promotional events in May, June 2015 aimed at, aimed at encouraging new applicants to the grant scheme. I was just looking an update on that. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's still yeah. under child care here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry, yeah. Oh. Sorry, you're just... 
Yes, the, have you got it in front of you, the current position? The grant. Would you say a third bullet point down? Uh, from the bottom, yeah. Oh, from the bottom. Yep. A, third, a third call will take place in late 2015. Mm -hmm. And I talked about um, a number of uh, promotional events in May, June 2015. And I'm just wondering, has that happened? I know, at, at the minute, yeah, the animation for the third call okay. is just beginning um, to get um, get going, so it hasn't happened as yet. Um, it has been slightly, uh, but we're still hopeful then that the, the third call will be made in September. I think the animation staff are now, are now, in, in, they're now in place. They're now in place. There was a delay in, in the recruitment or, and uh, uh, and getting into post some of those staff, I think, because of notice periods, but they're now in place. Mm -hmm. Um, would you have any updates regarding uh, rural childcare? I know I've raised it a number of times, but I'm really not getting anything definitive. And uh, I would have a wee concern in that, you know, I'm not getting any feedback whether or not funding for rural childcare is coming out of this pot of money. That yeah. the, the buck's going to be passed on to Dard. Yeah. Well, there, there was um, a key first action, as you know, for, for DARD in the rural childcare, uh, and you'll be aware that the, the business case that they produced was um, suggesting that um, there, there was less of a need than, than had first been thought. You'll know as well that the um, childcare think piece has been um, published now by DARD. Um, there's a number of, of issues that they want to look at that, that we would want to include in our new strategy as well. Um, and it's around um, things like childcare hubs and, and promoting those and, and, and looking at other ways to provide childcare in rural areas. Uh, because it may not be <coughs> necessarily the lack of um, actual places, it may be getting people, getting the transport or the access to some of those um, uh, places. Uh, may be one of the problems, but the think piece is out there at the moment, uh, and, and we do, and I think Martin um, maybe copied it to committee members um, or sh recently, following his last appearance here, did it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so did that there, and I mean, there's some um, good things within it that, um, you know, that we would hope to be including there in, in our, our strategy. Yeah, I mean, I find it interesting, and I would like to see the evidence around this, that it's not really to do with childcare places or accessibility. You know, there, there are a lack of facilities in rural areas. I know individuals who travel 17 miles out of their own rural communities into urban areas to access childcare facilities. So I'm baffled as to where this evidence is coming from. Um, well, there, there are places there. But it's an issue of accessibility. Is that not a contradiction? It, it's, I, mean, I suppose it's really for Dard, um, you know, in, in terms of what they um, have found and the evidence they've found and, and put into their business case. And, and I suppose, um, I, I mean, we could discuss further with Dard, or, um, but I think they. I think part of the evidence that they into. I'm engaging first. with Dard officials as well. Yeah, I think that they, they, they had, under a previous program, they, they tried to promote rural childcare and they provided training and I don't know if they've any financial assistance for people to set up rural childcare businesses. And they thought that the attrition rate in relation to uh, childminders, essentially, uh, that the attrition rate in terms of, of uh, those people who'd went through that program was very high. Uh, and the, the, on the basis of that, they were saying, well, is there really a, sustain, a sustainable demand out there? Now, it could be that you know, family circumstances changed and, and, and people said, well, you know, I've got young children mm -hmm. myself, I run a childcare business, they've got a bit older, I'd like to go back to whatever I used to do. So, I don't know. But we, we will, we will uh, uh, continue to engage with, with, yeah, with DARD yeah. on that. But that, that actually doesn't stack up because the Department of Education has a policy where you know you don't close rural schools um, because of low numbers, and in our rural areas, uh, you know we may have only about 30 kids attending a school, and that's the way it is, and that's reflective of the population in that area. But that is no reason to close down a school or not to put childcare facilities in that area. We'll, we'll look at that. Yeah. I think, that, I think yeah. the challenge for DART is coming up with a sustainable model of, of rural childcare. And, maybe, and one of the things we'd looked at, I think the Think Peace talks about this, mm -hmm. is, a, is a sort of mixed economy of childminders but with some centres 
so that the, 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 the children who are normally with the, the childminder also have the exposure to you know a wider group and a bit maybe a bit more challenge and, and enrichment in terms of that, that setting. And you can also through that provide a little bit of cover if perhaps the the uh, the, uh, the the childminder's own children are sick or whatever. Uh, or um, you know to cover the, those per periods when you, when you need to sort of to provide a bit of uh, you know peer su peer support for illness or, or for peaks in demand or something. But that's something we will we'll continue to engage with with uh, Dardor and we'll raise it at the program board tomorrow. Uh. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, folks, I'll, I'll bring us to a closer risk of losing court. Thanks for your presentation. <laughs> um, I, I, I've personally on record a number of times stated I don't think there's any more important task for government departments than to openly, transparently, publicly report whether they have achieved what they said they were going to achieve. I think serious questions have been raised today around how well your department has has done that. Um, that's not just yourselves. That that's you know, primarily ministers. Um, you know, I, I think we've established that the written reports that we've uh, been receiving have been uh, changing, and that they have been nowhere near as detailed as the oral evidence that we have extracted from you today. Um, the reporting of uh, program for government. Um, progress needs to be open and transparent, um, and, and yet it appears to be a movable face. We have £1 million out of £80 million in social investment fund, uh, we think £3.4 million out of 12 on childcare, uh, no racial equality strategy, no gender equality strategy, in my opinion an anemic good relations strategy. Um, the First and Deputy First Minister, I suppose we can see therefore why the First and Deputy First Minister appear to have decided not to give this report as a oral statement in the Assembly Chamber any longer. Uh, and indeed, um, they haven't attended this committee uh, once on this Assembly um, period from September to June, the First and Deputy First Minister. So, this is the First Minister who stated that he wanted the executive to be known from this period for uh, delivery. I see no real way to say it, the record of OFM DFM on those key issues other than delay. Um, so hopefully it will be possible to get slightly more consistent um, reporting on the programme for government prog uh, progress in the next uh, term. And maybe in closing, you can provide us with an, a short update as to how this report will be made publicly accessible and when we're going to receive a programme for government for the extended 15 to 16. Just brief. Uh, yeah, so we have, I can certainly cover cover the second in terms of the programme for government for the, for the extended period. That will be uh, subject to eventually to uh, executive agreement. Uh, I know a number of departments have fed into that already, but I am talking for some Okay. And, and how this type of information is currently made publicly available yeah, there? Yeah, I certainly do. You do, can you not answer that now? Hmm? You, can you not answer that now? Uh, I can answer it in general terms, but if I come back, I'll tell you when, when the most up-to-date uh, online re report. There is an online reporting tool uh, which uh, provides uh, refreshed information on progress around the, the programme for, for government. Uh, I need to come back to you when it was recent, when it most recently refreshed. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, uh, the last item on our agenda is any other business. Do members have any other business? Yes? No? <laughs> um, date and time for next meeting is next Wednesday, 2pm, room 30, Farm Buildings. Jared, thank you.